Madam President, are you ready for me to call roll? Yes. Trish Bode? Here. Gloria gonzalez Salakia. Alexis Grimes? Here. Aaron Johnson? Here. Jim McKay? Christine Maurer? Here. Anna Smith? Here. It is 6.16 p.m. and with the quorum of the board president, I will call the special meeting of the Leander ISD Board of Trustees to order. You'll notice our agenda is targeted tonight. We have two items. We'll go ahead and take up our first item, which is citizen comments. Um, please note there are other ways for uh, individuals to communicate with our Board of Trustees, but this is the time to um, have our citizens come speak to us um, so we can hear what's on their thoughts. My computer just completely died. Um, <clears throat> I will also, I know we have several We have several speakers who have been here before, so you all know the uh, common statements. I will sum up by saying our board operating procedures uh, request polite and professional conversation. This is not a back and forth discussion, so we will ask you to respect that limitation. And you will have tonight with a special, mit, a special meeting, one and a half minutes. Oh, there we go. And my power is back up. Um, and so I just kind of summarized everything. If you have, uh, yeah, I'm looking to see if our audience is aware of that. Um, I'm going to call the first speaker up here. I know that you will have 1.5 minutes to address the Board of Trustees. You'll hear chime when your time is up. When you come up to the table, please press the mic button to go ahead and speak and then press it, press it again when you conclude. We have three speakers signed up this evening. Paul will be our first speaker for the evening. Good evening, friends. I say that because I think we're friends. We're all in this community together, and we owe a lot of money together. And this bond proposal is just too much money. At the leaders' session I was at last week, I met a new friend, and they have been here since, I believe, 2004, and they are the auditor for the school. And I asked her, so how many people with 40 schools and over 40,000 kids and possibly 10,000 employees of contractors, subcontractors, people that throughout the course of the year come in contact with monies, disperses, how many people work under you? And she said, well, just recently we hired another one. I'm like, well, how many is that now? Two. Two. I have told some of my neighbors of this and they're like, so this is why our budget is where it's at. We have three auditors for so many people, for so many schools, over 40 schools. It's not, it's never gonna get it done. We need more help in that area. She deserves a medal, a raise, double. The whole thing needs to be revamped. We need to look at all the books, open everything up, going back probably 15 years and really sitting down and even to the tuck pointing of the bricks. And um, that's all I have to say. Paul, thank you. Our next speaker this evening will be Sally. Good evening, my name is Sally Zuniga. I'm here speaking for Heather Jones, who has been on your bond oversight committee since the very beginning of the 2017 bond. She says, recently during a Zoom, I was asked to vote to ask the board to sell the remaining bond authorization for major maintenance. I asked what would happen if we never sold those funds and to quote the CFO, it just sits there for about 50 years showing that the authorization is available. It doesn't go away. There is no provision. The CFO went on to say that the rating agencies won't like it if the money sits out there and that the 2021 bond would have to be bigger if we didn't recommend the admin approach to the board. All of this didn't feel right to me, so I decided to educate myself. When I searched school bonds in Texas, I came across lots of Texas Education Code, which governs bonds. One part was 45.110, and it addressed authorized but unissued bonds, the topic at hand. It stated that if such funds existed and the board wanted to use for a different purpose than what was specified in the election order, it must go back to the voters for a vote. 
I use this code in some searches to find something called an all bond council letter. Based on one from the 80s, the AG says that seven years is the cap before the bonds are static, not the 50 years stated by the CFO. Maybe this has changed in the last 40 years, or maybe the CFO should say she doesn't know. I keep getting presentations about all this leftover money we have sold and how we need to spend it. This too is not correct, as we can apply the unspent funds to retiring the bonds instead. Why is this option not being considered? I am very concerned that this misinformation was presented to the committee in order to get the vote that they want. If you really want to know what the community wants you to do, start by making, start by making sure committees have accurate, accurate information. Thank you, Sally. This is a mouthful in a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Thank you. You did excellent. Brandy? Is it still on? Yeah. <clears throat> I had previously emailed some of my concerns with the size of this bond, which looks like a Christmas wish list. Items were prioritized in tiers one through three, one being critical for academic safety, et cetera. I have concerns with how the committee weighed the district needs and how we can justify gaga pits and painted sidewalks as tier one. Very little, if anything, was cut from the original proposal since this includes all three tiers. An equity lens was used as well. For example, identifying these 13 elementary schools that don't have canopies over their playgrounds. However, in order to be equitable, all schools get new canopies. This mindset is wasteful, which does not ensure good stewardship of our tax dollars. I've also asked about conflicts of interest. As I look at the members of the CFAC and hear questions being asked, it becomes clear that some of these members could potentially benefit financially from the passage of this bond. Have all the members disclosed their conflicts of interest? It's concerning to see the meetings and members and district staff discussing the use of PACs and how they really need to push the message to taxpayers. Coming on the heels of a $400,000 COVID oops and an F financial say, rating, before bringing a bond like this to the community, the district should show evidence of improvement or good faith effort. I see neither, especially after reviewing policy AEA on Thursday's meeting and the purpose reads to provide guidance, establish framework, direct action to affect change within the LISD, to eradicate racism, intolerance, bigotry, and prejudice. Does this imply our children are racists and bigots, or is it the parents, or is it our neighbors that are the racists and bigots you propose to ask for a billion of their dollars from? The hypocrisy of this district is boundless. I also want to point out that the Open Meetings Act requires 72 hours notice. As of today, 48 hours from Thursday's meeting, there's no documents uploaded to the 85 agenda, and trying to squeeze in a vote would be a violation of the Texas Open Meeting Act. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. All right, for our citizens and audience watching in and our board, I'll remind you that we do have our regular Thursday night meeting. That will be our night that we do voting. And we will have, of course, citizen comments to speak on our agenda items there. And it will be for three minutes. Tonight, we have a discussion item. And as uh, the board uh, and for the audience to remember, this is um, we said we wanted to focus on this discussion. Um, and so this is why it's put, pulled off and set aside. So this evening we're going to focus on and discuss the Citizens Facility Advisory Committee recommendation and other items related to possible future bond elections. Uh, Dr. Gehring is going to be up at the front, I believe. Yeah. I'll send you up there so that we can all see him. As he walks us through some of our questions and kind of the current status.
today. Just want to acknowledge that those pictures are um, from Brandon Stanton. This one is from New York City in the United States. I was raised in intellectual worship of knowledge. But all my professors in college were small-minded, nasty little people, getting off on their own power, wanting me to parrot them while telling me they did. So I decided I was a nihilist and that I was going to do as many drugs as possible. If the goal is to spend your whole life trying to get rewards to trigger chemicals in your brain, why not go straight for the chemicals? But that didn't work out very well. It quickly became less of a philosophy and more of a massive drug addiction. He's like an angel. When he was younger, he would pass by our store every day. He couldn't speak back then. He couldn't even say his name, but he always passed by the store and gave off the warmest feelings. My father began to invite him in, and soon he was coming by the store every day to play. When he started spending time with us, he began to improve very quickly. We told him we needed his help in the shop. We think that all he needed was something to hope for. He began to tell us all about his feelings. He visited with everyone who came into the shop. He learned bits of English and Japanese. He changed our lives so much. My father loved him like a son, and he loved my father. They would always laugh together and dance together. When my father died, he was very sad for five months. He still prays for my father every time he eats a meal. Lately, all he can talk about is a girl in his class that he wants to marry. She also has Down syndrome. Every day, he talks about the wedding he will have, and he invites everyone he sees. He has invited over 5,000 people so far. He tells each person what they are supposed to bring to the wedding. His father will not allow him to get married. But we are thinking about having a wedding party and inviting everyone in the town. And that one is from Jerusalem. I want to tell you a story of two coolers. So this cooler has stickers on it. And these are from Raise Your Hand, Texas. Um, and they say the future of Texas is in our public schools. And I share that with you because that's what I believe very strongly. That's why I do what I do. Because the future of our great state is right here in our public schools. This is a Yeti cooler. Do you know this Yeti story? So Rob and Roy Seegers are the founders of Yeti. Rob and Roy Seegers both graduated from Dripping Springs High School. And they're fishermen. They're just regular kids. And they were out fishing on their boat. And they have a very peculiar fishing technique that forces them to have to get up and be able to look down into the water to see the fish. And so they used to stand on their cooler to do that on the boat. But the coolers kept caving in. And so they said, well, we need a better cooler. So what did they do? They started figuring out how they were going to do that. They ended up in the Philippines in a factory that used this technique that would give them the strength of cooler that they needed. And it's a long story, and in fact, I'm going to put an article from Inc. in your Friday memo that tells you the whole story. But they're entrepreneurs. They didn't start off this way. They started off building fishing rods and boats. And they didn't do very well. And they bumped into this idea, not the, this part of the cooler. I'm, I'm talking about the, the ice cooler, the big ice chest, right? 
they bumped into that because of the need and they just, their father was an entrepreneur, they were entrepreneurs and they figured it out, right? I met these two guys uh, while I was superintendent of dripping and uh, had a conversation with them and they told me one interesting part of the story that I want to share with you and that is that they nearly went bankrupt. So when you read the Inc. article, it only tells you all the success part, right? It paints this really amazing story of all these successes and it's now $450 million company, billion dollar company, something. But they nearly went bankrupt. And at that point, when they were about to go under, they stopped and said to themselves, well, if we're gonna go out, let's go out with a bang, right? Let's try to get rid of every last cooler that we have and make as much money as we can. So they raised the price. Now when they started, these were $300 coolers, right? That was not in the market. I mean, $300 coolers at Walmart, right? They were building a product that was targeted at a very specific audience and they were very expensive. But as they were about to go under, they decided, let's just raise the price. And that's when they took off. So I'll tell you an interesting story. The future of Texas is in our public schools. I think you have this at your tables. These are our core beliefs. You did an incredible amount of work on establishing these core beliefs as this is what we do, this is what we believe. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to review these because I think it's really critically important that we fall back on our core beliefs as we make difficult decisions. So as a public school organization, we hold these truths as our core beliefs. Each and every student is at the heart of our decisions. This requires a focus on students and all elements that impact their overall student experience in order for them to reach their maximum potential. LISD life changes, each and every staff member, should be empowered so they can inspire our students to own their learning. Our LISD family, which includes our students and their families, life changers, board, and community members, thrives when we ensure a welcoming, safe, and caring environment in which we treat one another with integrity, respect, fairness, and acceptance while appreciating our differences. A deliberate and intentional focus on relevant and deeper learning for each student will optimize individual outcomes and personal growth. In developing and maintaining meaningful, collaborative relationships between all our LISD family is vital for a whole child, student-driven experience. You followed that with some really great work on developing a vision and a mission statement. And I'm going to reference these two because it's really important that we tie our vision to the decisions that we're making. The hashtag one LISD community cultivates each student individually to produce the most sought after creators of our future world. And we do that by cultivating each individual student by knowing and appreciating them, creating a safe and supportive environment to nurture their personal growth and partnering with each family. And I took the liberty of making this pretty and laminating it, but this is not a final document. Okay, this is still in draft form. You had some input into this document, the graduate profile, but you have not approved this yet, and you will be getting this for approval in the coming months. Um, but there's still some work to do on this one. So I took the liberty of making it pretty to, to have at your tables today, but it is not a final document. There still could be changes. Thousands of hours have gone into this. You heard Sarah Martinez talk about this the other day. And a lot of input from a lot of different stakeholders. So Leander ISD learners are empowered to enrich our world and excel in a rapidly changing global society through a lifelong journey of character development, academic success, and fulfillment. We want them to be critical and creative thinkers who seek and solve problems through curiosity, flexibility, and innovation. We're looking for skilled communicators and collaborators who listen to understand, express ideas with empathy, and work collectively towards shared outcomes. 
We're trying to create compassionate community contributors who value diverse perspectives and share their unique gifts with the world. And we want adaptable and reflexive individuals who confidently embrace their strengths and challenges while pursuing their interests and passions. And to back that up, and I've put this at your table and it's on big sheets of paper because you need to be able to, to read along with all this. I'm not going to go over this one. But these are the I can statements that have been developed in a continuum from pre-K all the way to our graduate program. These are developed to align with these four core critical competencies that we're looking for and point out that each and every one of our kids fits somewhere on this continuum in all four of these categories. And our goal is to push them as far along this continuum as possible. You'll also notice that not only are there early childhood indicators, K2 indicators, 3-5 indicators, 6-8 indicators, and 9-12 indicators, voice crack, but there are also adult learner indicators. Because this is not just about our kids, this is about each and every individual in our system. The adults matter because the adults are the ones that create the learning environment. So I would like to introduce a couple of our kids and just put these faces in front of you as we go into this conversation about how we plan for the future of our ISD. I'm not going to tell you too much about each of these, just to say that Jasmine was a graduate of the class of 2021. Sora Witch is going to be a senior and graduate in 2022. Preston is going to be a freshman for the class of 2025. Courtney is going to be in sixth grade, graduating in 2028. Sebastian is one of our incoming first graders. Look at that, he's going to graduate in 2033. And Radhika is going to be one of our new kindergartners who's going to graduate in the class of 2034. And then of course we have some pre-K kids coming in this year who are going to be the class of 2035 and some three-year-olds who are going to be the class of 2036. And of course right up here we have parents as teachers. It's okay. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's not your fun. <laughs> I didn't plan it that way, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> this was supposed to be this nice even segue. <coughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask us to take a moment. And I'd like you to stand up, if you wish to, or you can stay seated. But I want us to just breathe for a second. I'm going to ask you to just, you can stand up if you want. You don't have to. So we're going to breathe in as big as you can, and we're just going to hold it for a count of four, and we're going to breathe out and push everything out as hard as you can and hold it for a count of four. And we're going to do that four times. So here we go, breathe in. Breathe out, push it all the way out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Push it all the way out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Push it all the way out. Breathe in. 
like for you to reflect quietly for just a second. I don't want you to write anything down. I don't want you to think about why you're here. I want you to really think hard about why you give up so much of your time and effort and blood, sweat and tears. As a volunteer, you make really, really hard decisions. so much for indulging me in, in that little moment. So Madam President Board Members, I'm here tonight to talk to you about the recommendations that came to us from our Citizens Facility Advisory Committee and other items related to what is a possible future bond election and a really difficult decision to make. So just a quick recap on where we are and how we got to this point, uh, the process that, that has got us to this point. So the CFAC committee work was of course five subcommittees, you've heard all this before, about 150 volunteers, a steering committee who then took those many, many hours of work of the vol volunteers on the subcommittees and pushed all that together. The charge to that committee was examine what the needs of the district are in order to manage the growth that's coming in the next three to five years. They examined a lot of information, including the demographic report from population and survey analysts, a lot of other data. And they came up with about 1.5 billion in projects. We try to make this process as transparent as possible. We tried to make sure that board members had access to the meetings, to all the information, that the public had access to all the meetings and all the information. Um, we allowed board members to pick who they put on that committee to report back to them. We included a lot of people in the process and we tried to really get to where the CFAC committee could bring you a solid recommendation. And they did that. This was the summary slide that came from their presentation, and they presented to you 933.4 million for a November 2nd, 2021 election. And they also asked us to consider using previous bond project savings to perhaps reduce that number below the 900 million. We did ask the Bond Oversight Committee to weigh in on how they felt about using those previous bond savings because that's the job of the Bond Oversight Committee. Um, and we got some responses from not all the members. So those who did respond um, gave us a pretty solid indication that they felt like using those savings um, in the way that I'm going to describe in a little bit is uh, something that they would support. This was not a vote necessary or a formal recommendation that they're making, but we wanted to at least get their input before we came to you tonight. Several themes came out through the CFAC recommendation summary, um, and those were particularly that we have to manage the growth that's coming because of the demographic report. We have to address our aging schools. We have to make sure that uh, we keep up the excellence in facilities that have come to be the expectation in the under ISD, and that we address technology. Uh, there were some things that were left on the table in the last, in the 2017 bond in technology, and so we're having to make up some ground um, and then make sure that we keep up with the growth as we apply technology in a rapidly changing world. I really like this highlight section because they pointed out that 
this package that they presented to the board in this recommendation addresses all students in all schools. That it's really centered around the student experience um, and that the recommendation for the 933.4 million can be executed without increase in the tax rate. We requested from Basilis and Associates a telephone survey of likely voters in the district, and they brought that report to the board, and so you've seen that. This is just a summary slide that comes from them, and we just rebranded it for this presentation. But when we looked at the initial ballot language only, we came out with 33.3% against both propositions, and we presented them just two propositions. I'll point out that that may not be the final language that comes to you. There may be more than two propositions uh, as we examine the law change that happened and interact with bond council, we may bring you more than two propositions. Um, I'll explain that in a little more, more detail in a little bit. Uh, we had 25.3% mixed or unsure and then 41.4% for both propositions. They then did some informing, some educating during that process of that telephone interview and then they asked this same question again near the end of the interview and after that additional information was provided to, to the folks, we came up with 30% against both propositions, 18% were mixed or unsure and 52% were in support of both propositions. I wanted to examine a little bit uh, some of the bond history because I think that's really important for us to understand what's happened in the recent past. And I want to go back one more that's not on this slide to the year 2000. Um, and if you look at what happened in the 2000 bond, you'll see a lot of new construction of schools that was really in the height of the growth in the district. And we were building sometimes multiple campuses a year, opening multiple campuses a year. The reason that that is important is because those schools that were built in the 2000 bond are now coming up for major renovation. And that major renovation is part of what the CFAC committee examined very carefully um, and included in, in their recommendation. But I'll point out that in 2006, uh, the district passed a proposition one with 60% support for 286 million and they failed two other propositions. The 6.9 million was for uh, renovations at Bible Stadium and the 7 million in proposition 3 was for an innovatorium. In 2007, just one year later, the district passed a bond with 56% support for 559 million. And so I'll point out that in the period of two years, the district passed almost $800 million in bonds. And then in 2017, which is 10 years later, and this is interesting to me because between 2007 and 2017, of course we had the crash in 2008 and then the reduction in staff in 2011, um, and some major things slowed down and changed in that time. That 2007 bond, when it was passed, was intended to be a three-year bond. Um, because of the growth projections at the time. So some major things changed in there. We ended up being able to stretch that for 10 years. And then in 2017, we had two-thirds support for 454.4 million. There were some things that were left on the table in 2017, um, some projects that didn't get onto that $454.4 million bond that the CFAX committee talked about um, that now have become urgent issues. So this was a big question um, at this time last year because there was a lot of uncertainty around what was going to happen to our enrollment, right? And was the growth going to continue and pick up again or were we going to be in a permanent change of trajectory for the district? So last year we did drop enrollment for I think the first time in history and perhaps somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the district's been growing at a really rapid rate. Um, every year, except for last year where we saw a drop in enrollment because of COVID. 
Um, and just to point out that we ended the year 40,761 last year, um, and our current enrollment as of uh, 7.30, July 30th, is 42,742 students. And so we're seeing what Passa pointed out to us, that the students are coming back, and not only the ones who didn't come last year are coming back, but also the projected growth for this year is starting to happen. So we have passed our budget projection number, um, and we continue to see students enrolling in the district every day. Uh, Passa's mid Growth analysis produces 48,576 students by 2026 and 53,206 students by 2031 as we continue to grow mostly in the northern part of the district. So if we look at the map, the map represents the new housing developments and new houses that are coming on, about 20, almost 21,000 of them in the next 10 year period. And of course this is a projection and PASA will tell you that they're pretty sure in their five-year projection, and they're a little less sure as they get from five to ten years in that projection, um, which is why they produce a low, a mid, and a high growth scenario for the district, because they know that as you get beyond five years, then the guesses get a little less accurate. The good news is that we do go back to PASA on an annual basis, and they give us updates, and they're constantly modifying these numbers to make sure that we're understanding where we are. So this is not a one and done. This is definitely part of a continuous cycle of, of watching what's happening to enrollment. Um, nine new schools are projected in the next 10 year period, about 12,500 students. And you can see from the red and the orange, this is all happening in this northern horseshoe, in the northern part of the district. And you can see that in the southern part of the district, we're adding very few students um, and remaining really steady in that central part of the district in, in the Cedar Park area. Um, so this makes planning for growth tricky because we will have facility space in some of our central and southern schools and then have this great need um, for new facilities or finding a way to manage the growth in the northern part of the district. Not new information for you, but I just want to make sure we get that in All right. So, the team has been doing some significant work over the last week since we met the last time to try to figure out an answer to your questions. Um, and, and so, there was a lot of concern last time about that number, 933.4 million. And so what Jimmy and his team did is they went back in and said, okay, so how can we split this apart? How can we manage this instead of a four-year cycle? Can we produce a three-year cycle that works and makes sense? And we can, in fact, do that. So we did two things. He split out the bond by year so that he could see what happened in year one, in year two, in year three, and in year four. And what we did is we moved everything that's in year four out of the bond number, which included elementary number 34 and some other projects. But those are the, that's the significant one. And then we also went back and said, okay, so we think that we can push the early college high school out of the three-year bond. And the reason that we can do that is because we are partnering with ACC at the San Gabriel campus Right now they have facility capacity for us to start the early college high school in their facility. We've had conversations with Dr. Rhodes and his team and they've agreed to allow us to do that. That will be huge cost saving for us and also benefit to them because they get use, full use of their facility um, that's just standing empty right now. Um, and we feel like we can stretch that out so that the planning, design, and then construction of the early college high school, which is going to happen on that ACC campus, can be pushed into that next three-year bond. And it also takes the administration building addition, which is about 19 million, so that early college high school piece is uh, 29 million. It takes the administration building at 19 million and pushes it outside of the, of the three-year window as well. That is not ideal. In fact, that is really painful for us. So here's what I'm going to request if the board looks at this option and decides that they want to do this. 
is that we find some money in fund balance. When I say some money, I'd like to take a million dollars out of fund balance to supply portables for the current site here at the admin building so that I can get the team situated where they need to be. So I think that will get us what we need on this site to be able to effectively manage the administration growth as we continue to see that growth of 12,500 students over the next 10 years or so. That doesn't mean we won't build that administration building uh, addition at all. It just means that we'll push it outside of this window, but we have to have the support to be able to do that if, if that's something that we decide to do. So that brings this number down to 813.2 million. We also look to say, okay, so this is not just about right now, right? Because we're continuing to grow, so we have to keep an eye on the future. And so if we were in a four-year cycle, Jimmy went out and said, okay, so what would the next four-year cycle look like? And he took just a bare minimum. So this is not a CFAC process. This is Jimmy saying, based on the demographic projections, what are the essential things that we have to have? One of those essential things is going to be high school number seven, and that's a $287 million project. So when we push that out, then we see that in 2025, if we go to bond again, it would be somewhere in the range of $700 million. If we go to a three-year cycle and we do the reductions the way that we've looked at them and do the 813.2 million, then in 2024, in three years' time, um, we come back with about 700 million instead of the 706. You cannot compare the four-year cycle and the three-year cycle, so don't get concerned about the 700 number being close to each other. Okay, it's just. It's an apples and oranges comparison. It doesn't make any sense to compare the two, so don't try to get your brain around that. It doesn't work. Um, but just know that we are watching out in the future to say, if we do this, then what happens out there? The move to the 813.2 million does not delete any of the projects that the CFAC committee recommended. All it does is rearranges them in the grand scheme of things. Okay? And then we would like to consider also the 41 million that we have in bond savings. And let me point out that we used this $41 million number, and so I'm going to start with that one, but I'm going to point out that it's actually $50 million that we have in bond savings. We are recommending as an administration that you take the $9 million and apply it to major maintenance because that will completely solve our major maintenance problem for the long term. That leaves us with $41 million in bond savings. In 2007 bond, there was an additional elementary school that the board chose to not build and instead did secure vestibules at all of the elementary schools. And also, one other thing, shout out for me. Flex Labs at the high school. Thank you, Jim. And so, one of the elementary schools in the 2021 bond is 46.5 million. So we could apply this 41 million to that 46.5 and, and just keep the additional dollars, the, whatever the math is, 5.5 million. I didn't do the math right. Inside, that $813.2 million number. Well, actually, then that drops down to 772. So we take the four year, we move to three year, we get from 933.4 to 813.2 by shifting some projects around. We apply the 41 million in savings to build one of the first elementary schools. We keep the excess that we need to build that entire elementary school in the bond. That takes us down to 772. <coughs> You've heard of, okay. You've heard a lot from <coughs> Blake and Elaine and the team about what does the financials of this look like. And so two questions were asked at the board meeting last time. Um, 
One of them was, what happens if we don't grow in AD value at what we were projecting in the pro forma? And so that's that top line where it says 933 million, and we're projecting 10%, 5%, and 3% in 23, 24, 25. The number below that is the excess collections that we have, and the answer to the second question, which was, what happens to the tax rate? This assumption keeps the tax rate constant at 46.25. With the new assumption of 5%, 3%, and 1% in 23, 24, 25, we ran 813 million to match the three-year number that I showed on the previous slide. And we have the capacity to be able to do that and you still have some excess collections, especially in the first year, because of that lower number. And that allows us to get, build the pro forma. The pro forma is attached in your packet, by the way, and so that you can examine those numbers in detail. I want to point out some really prudent fiscal management that this Board of Trustees has exercised over a long period of time. So you've seen this before in the debt profile conversation that we had at the board. But you have reduced the overall capital appreciation bonds, the CAVs, from 75% down to 36%. And we're not done because your goal is 25%. You've done that through using those excess collections to buy down the debt and to refinance the debt whenever you could. And you've done it with the advice of PFM and you've done an absolutely fantastic job of putting this district in a really, really sound financial position. A sound enough position that enables us to talk about 933 million or 813 million or 772 million. You've also reduced your principal and interest by 733 million while issuing $286 million in new bonds and you've reduced the repayment terms of all your debt by five years over this period. And that, not everybody understands how big a deal that is. This board has done incredible work with our financial advisors to get this district in that position. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, board members, for giving me the grace and patience. I'm going to stay right here for a second and I'm going to start letting you have discussion or ask questions so I can flip backwards and forwards on the slides. I do realize that pretty quickly probably I'm going to get out of my depth and then I've got lots of friends back here who are going to come and help me. Right? Board members, questions? We also have uh, Sean Cranston, Jeremy Trimble here, um, in case we have questions of them as well. Do, do, do we want board members to go ahead and invite them up? Do you have questions for them? Questions for, well, we'll start with Dr. Gary and then we'll call you guys. Can you just repeat, um, you said over three years we issued 800 million bonds. It was back in 2006. So when you look at the bond history of the district, you can see it back up there again. No, sorry, I no you're fine. Sorry, no, I did the same thing. You're looking at the people. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm not sure. I wasn't here, so I don't right. know what happened. I wasn't here either. In 2007, why we did a bond back to back like that. Um, but there must have been a good reason. Right. right? Um, but if you look at what passed, passed 286 million in 06 and then 559 million in 07, when you add those two together, you get 800 and something. Thank you. Looking at the three-year cycle, four-year cycle, um, not including the early college high school permanent building and, and that three-year, I get that, you know, we have this benefit at ACE with ACC right now, but I have concerns like long-term uh, about what that 
what that means. So is that the only thing that we're removing at that point? And like, can you talk about the other things that obviously there, there are other things. Uh, can you talk about all of those? I can, but I don't want to right now. Okay. <laughs> and, and here's why. So the biggest thing is elementary number 34, which right. is the last one in the line. Um, and we feel comfortable. I mean, it was designed to be in year four from the beginning. So it literally just goes into the first year of the next bond. And that naturally does that and that's okay. There are some other detailed projects in there that add up to less money. But of course that elementary 34 is in the $46 million range or north of that. So that's the big number that helps to push some of that out. I'm happy to sit down with you and Jimmy and go through the spreadsheet that we have that shows you exactly all the math that Jimmy did to push these projects and, and talk about the rationale. But I really feel like that's a one-on-one -on -one conversation that we need to have separately between now and when you have to make this decision. I Dr. guess, let me rephrase that question then. Um, <laughs> I won't go through individual projects. I, I guess I'm worried about um, when we talk about all parts of our district because we know that the big part of the growth is up in the north if if we if we're shifting a lot that is for further north growth and then in um we're counting on that that second election what yes. happens then okay. so um we feel like we can push early college high school because we have the building capacity at ACC. We, in our conversations with ACC, feel like we can stretch that capacity one more year and get that in the next bond. Now, if it doesn't pass in the next bond, then we're gonna to have to rethink that entire process. Um, we do have the ability to put portables on that ACC campus, and the reason I know that is because Round Rock has done exactly that um, on the Round Rock ACC campus with their early college high school. And so we have a path forward regardless of whether we can build a permanent facility or not. Um, and so we feel comfortable in pushing that one out into year four. Does, is, is there another part of that question? I will say that the other school of choice is 46 million and that one is staying in the three year. That's in that 813 number. Okay. And that's also designed to manage the growth of more. And we have to do that because if we then don't, then the we have school. to bring comprehensive high school seven right. back into the three years. Okay. And that way we lose 45 million, we add 287 million. Okay, back in. that was part of that other question is if we're not doing that, then what does that do for the other high school yeah. that we're not putting in there? Okay. okay. So in reviewing the the presentation that the CFAC committee gave, and I, I want to just say thank you to all of the volunteers that did that job because it was not an easy job. Um, I went through and, and I felt very comfortable with the equity that across the board from elementary to middle to high to uh, paying attention to our older schools that need some love. I feel like there's no reason why a kid at Fabian shouldn't have the same experience as a kid at Tarvin. And to me, that's one of the most important things that we're looking at here. And that means equitable playgrounds. That means equitable shade structure. That means equitable everything. And I think there's no reason why, um, like I said, a kiddo at Fabian or Nauman or one of the older campuses shouldn't have the same experience as a kiddo in the north part of the district or in the Steiner part of the district. And so I feel very comfortable with the recommendations given. I appreciate that the effort to go to, to drop the early college building. I'm a little concerned about um, what else makes up that difference in that money. And I, I have a very vested interest in knowing exactly what would be moved. Thank you. Um, we'd be happy to sit down with you in the next week or so and run through exactly what that is. And we'd like to just do that one on one. Sorry, I'm gonna go back to one question. When we talk about the portables, and, and I know exactly what you're referring to now with the portables that Round Rock has there. I guess my concern there is, do we really create a school environment when it is in 
like is that something that's desirable does when we're looking at numbers and the number of students that would be participating in that as we're doing our planning for growth um does that impact because it doesn't feel like a campus it really it loses all of that i think once once you do it in that format where here's a portable, here's your office, and then you're going, those are some of my concerns is it does, I've been to other early co early high school college that have their building and it, it's a school. It feels like a school, it's a campus. You have your own place. The way that Round Rock does it, it works. It's not, it's not, you don't have your own campus. You don't feel, I don't feel like you have that same sense. Um, I think about some students that really would have, I have one student that I think would have done really well in that format. I don't think he would have liked the whole portable type of feel because it just doesn't feel like you're really part of an LISD school. And so I wonder if when we're looking at numbers, how that impacts the number of students that would choose that also. Thank you for that, and, and I will say that personally, uh, that's why we designed it in the four-year cycle to be included in that because we we felt like, and you never know what happens, but we felt like we could get them to go from that ACC college campus, which is a brand new facility, into our brand new facility, um, and they get the experience that our students deserve in LISD. Um, what we're saying is that we can do it. And it's possible that in the three-year cycle we can still manage that, um, depending on what happens to ACC and the growth of their population and their students. Because if they still have space in their building, then that's okay. Then we can stretch that out a little longer. And Dr. Rhodes and his team have, have said that that's okay for us to do that. But if they run out of space, if they fill up and they have to push us out, which could happen, um, then you know, we'd have to do something else. Um, and so that would be a temporary solution until we can build that permanent building. It wouldn't mean that we're not building that permanent building. Unless, of course, in the next bond, the community, the CFAC com committee at that point in time decides that's not important anymore or I can't predict what's going to happen then. But the plan would be to be in portables for as short a time as possible while they build that, construct that new facility and get it into a permanent early college high school. Can I ask really quickly, and then I'll let you go. Uh, okay. the, um, the, the agreement with ACC, is that something we pay them for? Or is that something, it's a gentle, gentleman's agreement? What, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that doesn't work really well anymore. Um, <laughs> Sean, Sean won't let me do that anymore. <laughs> um, no, that, that would be a lease agreement, a ground lease agreement. Um, those have to be long-term agreements for us to be able to build a facility on somebody else's property. Um, so it would have to exceed the life of that facility in order for us to do that deal. But we've talked with ACC about that and they're very comfortable with making that work. A bond council has agreed that that's a perfectly good way to do that. It, it saves us from purchasing land for that particular site. That site is ideal because as they get into 11th and 12th grade, they're spending actually less time on our facility and more time on the college campus. And so being connected like that really creates this college experience so that when they graduate with their high school diploma and they walk across the stage and they get their associate's degree at the same time, um, they're ready to walk out the door and enter as juniors into a four-year institution, if that's what they choose to do, or walk out the door into a job or into whatever else, whatever their next step is. Say if we do the portables at ACC, I'm assuming that we're in charge of the maintenance. How does that going to work out? And will other people be using them, or will they just be LISD portables for our early childhood school? I keep I keep calling it early childhood. I'm sorry, guys. Early college. I, I, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> just um, no, that is our facility, right? So we are leasing the ground underneath facilities that are owned by LISD. So they'll be for our students use only. It'll be our school. It'll be as if we own that property. It's just that we don't actually actively own the land. Um, so maintenance of the buildings, all of that is our responsibility. And that's what we developed that agreement to, to speak to. 
Dr. Kering, I just want to make sure as, as we go through these discussions, the election too, all those, those numbers are there. They're, they're just, um, it's not after CFAC discussions. I mean, these numbers could change. Really, where we should focus our attentions right now are the election one, the four-year, or the three-year cycle, assuming that when we make a motion as a board, um, we don't have motion language yet on our Thursday meeting. Thursday would be an action item if we wanted to. This would be where you would look at for motion language. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Madam President, because that's really, really important, right? So what we're talking about is just row one, election one. Um, we put election two, that second row, in there just as reference. Those are not at all what the number's going to look like. That is the bare bones of what the growth projection set by PASA puts on the table for us. That's honestly just new construction to deal with the growth um, and, and some of the major renovation work that, that has to come in at that time. So Jimmy's done that work, but that number is not a CFAC number that nobody's even thought about that. The only other reason that I'll point out that that row is important is because in a four-year cycle, that bond election comes in 2025. So that CFAC work starts in January of 2025 with a bond election in November of 2025. In the three-year cycle, the CFAC work starts in January of 2024 with a bond election in November of 2024. So I'll just point that out. Yeah, and just to close out on that item, uh, that election two and the amounts indicated there, what's the time horizon estimated for those dollars? So that's a four-year cycle. So that would be another, so in election two to 2025, the 706 million is a four-year cycle. Uh -huh. And then the 2024, $700 million is a three-year cycle. So two four-year cycles and two three-year cycles. Yeah, so this is what we're looking at. If we go on a four-year cycle, this is what it looks like. If we go on a three-year cycle, this is what it looks like. So I'm not interchanging yeah. cycles, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, so let me, let me make a high-level comment first. I, I know a lot of work has gone into uh, what we see today compared to our previous discussion on the 22nd of July about this. Um, and I appreciate the effort that has gone into what we see tonight. I must say, however, it falls well short of what I was expecting we would have to work with in tonight's conversation. Um, I anticipated that we'd come here and see the original layout in terms of how projects were scheduled over the issuing period, and then we would see proposed options for how that might be modified into a, a three-year schedule or something along those lines. We don't have anything as a group to work with tonight. We just have A, what you saw last time, and B, uh, a new option. And we don't have any of the details behind it. And I find it, um, I find it frustrating, um, I could use a stronger word, that you are encouraging board members to have a conversation behind closed doors with staff if they have questions about those details when everything up to this point has been completely open to our community. So I don't understand why those details can't still be open to our community uh, and why we're not providing that level of detail even to our board members for tonight's discussion. That's a great point, Aaron, and I appreciate you bringing that up. So I wanna make sure that the board understands where their decision-making and the level of decision-making is, and what the administration's work is. So you charged us last time on the 22nd to go away and do this work and to bring you back a recommendation, and that's exactly what we've done. I'm happy in the interim, as I mentioned to Christine and to Gloria, to sit down with you, with Jimmy, and to go through every single project, to go through every line. I just don't feel like this conversation is the right place to do that. Once we've had those conversations, you're still going to have, a, you're not making a decision tonight. You're going to come back at another public meeting where you can lay out everything that you want to lay out as a board member about what those details are. I just didn't feel like, in my professional judgment, this was the right environment to do that in, or that that's necessarily good board work. And my job as the superintendent is to bring you a recommendation for how to move forward. And that's what I've done. Well, I, I appreciate your perspective on this. I think you have prevented us from doing 
work at a workshop by not providing us the materials with which to do the work. Instead, we received a presentation. We can talk behind closed doors with your staff about it between now and Thursday, two days from now, and our community won't see any of those materials in the meantime. All they have is what we have here, which frankly doesn't give them a lot to go on. For members of our community who participated in the steering committee, for instance, I don't think they can understand what's changed from what they recommended to us to what's now being proposed in the second option. Um, and if I can put a little finer point on this, I'm still trying to connect the dots in terms of the bond series that are proposed. Um, in our prior meeting on the 22nd, um, we saw a, a layout that was essentially five years of bond series issuance, right? Beginning in 2022 and the final in 2026. Um, now we're seeing in the revised $933 million, the, the election won, we're seeing now a three-year issuance schedule. If I look at the pro forma and a three-year issuance for the 813 million, I don't know what's changed there. I was expecting to see a layout that matched the original five-year issuance, but now we're seeing a three-year issuance for the 933 million. I don't know what's behind that change either. Thank you for that question. So I am now officially out of my debt. And so I'm going to call on my friend back here, so Elaine and Blake, if you wouldn't mind. Good evening, board. Uh, Blake Roberts, PFM Financial Advisors, advisor to Leander ISD. Thank you for having me. Uh, to answer your, your question, um, really, I, I don't yet have a precise sort of calculus as to we will issue this in this year. What the attempted uh, attempt was at the revised pro formas was to show in the most conservative approach where we uh, sort of only assume three years of tax base growth, can we issue what is being proposed, whether it's 933 or 813 or something else. And so the attempt in those models is to illustrate sort of what that looks like from a capacity standpoint, keeping in mind that in every model, we assume uh, three years of tax base growth and then it's constant thereafter. So the, re the revenue line is not changing, whether it's issuances in year three or four or five, the revenue line is fixed being your capacity. So. Whether you issue uh, you know, 200 in year one versus 250 or three, the, the attempt at the model is just to show this is what the capacity looks like. The practical effect is when you accelerate the issuances, what you will see in those models is that the, the surplus funds in the INS account are, are, are reduced. So in a five year issuance phase, you wouldn't be issuing as many bonds up front. You would be layering those on more gradually uh, so even in that constant growth or, or constant uh, INS revenue line, you would have uh, more uh, excess INS funds in the early years. The effect of accelerating those bonds, again, to be conservative, is to illustrate that at this capacity line, this is what the impact would be to uh, your, your bond capacity and, and then the uh, over levy, if you will, the excess funds for INS cash. So the model is not intended to be a precise illustration of how the issuances would flow. Um, it's to simply show a conservative approach to what those would look like. So there are three scenarios for, for the public. It's the original uh, same amount, 933, with the original growth assumptions. It, it was great feedback in terms of that's a little bit uncomfortable, so let's rattle those back. So we've shown a second scenario with that same issuance amount with the assumptions that we were asked to come back with, which are, are reasonable. 5% tax base growth next year, 3% the following year, 1% thereafter. Uh, I think the term used last time was, was is the model fragile? And I think you see that, that, that yes, in fact it is. At that bigger number, you are, you are pushing the needle on, uh, can you afford to do that? And, and frankly, you would need to delay issuances or really wait for more tax base to come online. So that's takeaway number one for me. 
Uh, and then the second scenario was, in speaking with Jimmy and Elaine, is 813 doable in a compressed three-year time horizon? Again, uh, not precise on when you would issue. In that second scenario, yes, it is achievable. Um, and again, I think the practical effect is just you're compressing issuances. So where you saw large surplus funds in your INS account projected last time, those are lessened in, in a compressed issuance cycle. Is it possible that a three-year cycle is a four or five-year issuance cycle? That's to be determined. That's not my area of expertise, but that hopefully contextualizes why you see different numbers from a financial capacity model versus a, a project budget and issuance timing. That makes sense to me, Blake. I appreciate the explanation. Uh, it reinforces that these are um, models. They are illustrations. Um, I, I think, uh, to your point, the three-year model in terms of issuance is a more conservative approach because it requires us to pay more sooner mm -hmm. um, with, with those issuances. Um, can you help me connect the dots just a little bit in terms of uh, the debt service figures that I see in the, the three scenarios. So for instance, in the 933 illustration from last week, if I sum the five years of debt issuances, I get $998 million. Um, if I sum the three years of debt issuances in tonight's $933 million model, I get $1 billion, $50 million. And then if I look at the three years of uh, the 813 model, those sum to $930 million. So I'm trying to understand what is driving the delta in those totals. So one thing that changed from last time is you have $167 million of uh, authorized but unissued debt. In the original information last time, we were issuing 65 million that's contemplated from the 2017 authorization. What was not yet known was uh, 58 million or so for land. So in this revised analysis, we're issuing a total of uh, f uh, 59 and 58 million over two years uh, from the 17 authorization. That second 23 issuances of 58 million was not part of the original analysis because that, that timing was not yet known. And visiting with the lane, it was thought that that would be a 23 issuance. So that is now the, 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 the new uh, sort of additional issuance from uh, last presentation. And, and that's also in the 813 million illustration. So I, I guess that, uh, sorry, what was the figure? 59 million? Yeah, yeah so for... <laughs> to, to follow, last time we assumed 65. That number has been revised to 59. The new number you didn't see last time was 58 next year from 17 which is in, 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 in both scenarios. Okay, you, you so the 65 is revised down to 59. You have a total of 117 of the 17 authorization that is potentially to be used. Okay. And the original models had not included that 58 million for land, and so to give you a true picture, we needed to put that in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I guess to conclude my comments, um, it reinforces for me the, the problem we have, which is that we don't know what the layout would be with either of these. We don't know what order and uh, what pace the administration plans to use the dollars, and so we can't do the analysis that I thought we were going to do tonight. And again, we'd be happy to sit down with you. Um, board meetings are not the only place that the board gets to do that work. We'd be happy to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and have those conversations and happy to bring back anything you'd like us to bring to the whole board in presentation um, at the next meeting. We're happy to do any of that work with you. So you're, you're willing to bring it to the whole board at Thursday's meeting? So you have the opportunity, we haven't, I know you, you have the opportunity to make this decision on Thursday. We also have one more opportunity that we talked about perhaps on the 12th, which is a week later. So if there is the will of the board to do that extra meeting, we can stretch that time out if you need more time to look at that. Otherwise, yes, we'd be happy to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with you. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not sure I follow. I'm asking for the detailed analysis and you're saying you'll only give it to me 
in a one-on-one -on -one session, or did you say you would be willing to bring it to the next board meeting? No, I said to you, you're welcome to any information that you need. We'd love to sit down with you. I can just give it to you if that's what you want. Uh, we're happy to sit down with you and walk through that with you and explain our thinking in producing this recommendation. Um, if you decide in that process that you'd like for us to bring all of that information to the whole board, I'm happy to do that too. But I have to talk to you about it. Uh, but I have to talk to you about it first before I tell you I think the whole board and the community should see it. No, sir, you can make a recommendation right now. You can ask uh, me to I bring would, that information to the whole board. I'm happy to do that. Whatever I thought that's what we did on the 22nd, so that's what I'm doing now. I also like to add, I don't think we get to complain that we can't stay here till 2 a.m. for board meetings and then say, I want to talk about every single thing and ask every single question and go through every single item here and then and then say but we can't be meeting every other day and we can't be having meetings that adjourn at 2 a.m. so I think that we have to decide which one of those it's going to be because I go through stuff as much as I can before I ask as much questions as I can I get that there are some things that we need to do here but we also keep saying Board President, Superintendent, you cannot keep me here till 2 a.m. We cannot keep staff here till 2 a.m. and then expect them to go to work. So let's move some stuff on to Friday memos. Let's move stuff off. And then as soon as stuff gets moved off to one-on-one, -on -one, you had no right to move that off of the board. This shouldn't have been on a Friday memo. This shouldn't have been a one-on-one. -on -one. This shouldn't have been an email. We, we have to decide what it's going to be because we can't be here till 2 a.m. Other districts are meeting, other districts are doing the same type of work we're doing in a COVID environment and they're not having board meetings till 2 a.m. And so we, we gotta pick which one is it gonna be. We wanna go through every single thing here and at these meetings, all right, bring your sleeping bag and let's come every other day. But no, it doesn't get to be both. You're presenting a false choice. It's 736. This is a workshop. I'm here. I'm ready to discuss it. I've reviewed the materials before the meeting. I'm ready. I talked to Dr. Gearing recently in preparation for this meeting. I thought we were going to receive the materials that I just referenced, the same materials we talked about on the 22nd that would help us to see how these projects lay out over the intended period. I don't have that information. We can't have a material conversation about it. I have no more questions. I'm ready to go home. We don't have a lot of information to work from. And, and I think we've wasted people's time because we don't have the resources to have a discussion about this. Uh, so I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to understand, Aaron. Um, are you wanting like the CFAX recommendations where everything's at? Are you wanting it on a spreadsheet to like go by each line item to decide what we're using for three? I'm just, I'm trying to understand what you're asking for. I'm happy to explain it again. I'm sorry if I've not done it clearly. I don't think it's that confusing. Um, I, I know, it just sounds like you're wanting to pick, a choo pick and choose with the CFAC recommendations, and I don't think that's our job, really. I've said very clearly before, and I still believe it today, uh, the CFAC recommendations in total are good recommendations, and I support them. My question is, how do we shrink $933 million over four years to a three-year piece, right? We've got one proposal here, but I don't understand what choices were made in getting there. The CFAC and our community have worked for months to get to a detailed recommendation. I have nothing to go on in terms of how we get to this revised proposal. I don't have any of those details. I don't have any opportunity to discuss those details. That's what I'm asking for, right? Is in order to do that, we have to have an understanding of how the projects that the CFAC recommended lay out over time, over that four-year period, right? Which projects do we anticipate bonding and beginning in year one? What projects do we anticipate bonding and beginning in year two? And so on. What does that look like? Therefore, if we backtrack into a three-year proposal, what does that look like? And what are the decisions on the margin about which projects go into or out of this three-year proposal? We can't have any of that discussion. I will reference again that I honestly don't think that's the board's job. You hire a superintendent and you hire a fantastic staff. You have committee recommendations.
with respect, I'm not here to be counseled about what my job is. The people elected me to come here and do a job, I'm trying to do the job. If you think I'm way off base, then the last decades maybe been a waste and I've got a total misunderstanding of my job. But I think what I'm asking for is completely reasonable. We've been very transparent with our community up to this point. There's no reason for us to stop doing that. Thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate that. The bottom line is I don't have the information that you need at this moment. I have referenced that I'm happy to meet with you. I'm happy to share that information with you tonight. As soon as we're done with this meeting, I'm happy to have those conversations. I'm happy to bring any of that information back to the board. But the bottom line is I don't have that information for you. I understand. I'll renew my request to have it as soon as possible and to make it available to our community. If we can have it for the Thursday board meeting, so be it. Yes, sir. Bruce, would it be okay if we had Sean and Jeremy come up here a little bit just to Absolutely. give us some background and see that? That'd be great. Madam President, um, I think we should talk a little bit about that Thursday meeting. I don't think, I, would, I don't want to be here till 2 a.m. I don't think it's fair to our staff that has to run a convocation. And so I would kindly recommend that you receive, we receive all of that information and it can be sent to us. And then if we have meetings, it can be posted online. We can have that meeting that available. Thursday night we have a full agenda and I don't think that that is the time or place to add another few hours to because then we're also going to be here grumpy at 12 a.m. saying this isn't the time or place for me to have this long discussion. I actually agree. Um, I don't want to keep our staff here late Thursday either. I thought that was the purpose of having tonight's meeting. And so um, if we're not prepared to have that discussion tonight, then uh, what's our alternative? Uh, I guess if we can't discuss it as a board at the next meeting either, um, my question is when can we discuss it and when can our community see it? That's kind of a critical element of this too. So that information I heard over and over was going to be provided and made available to you and to anyone else that wanted to see it. That information, can it be put on a board? Can we add that to um, to either the, yes, the board packet can, for next we week? Can, we can post it to the board packet immediately we leave from this meeting. Okay. Um, Thank I just, you. Can I say as a board, we, we do need to decide. I think we all have different levels of need for information to be comfortable moving forward with a decision. And I think what I've heard indirectly from board members is that um, sometimes different board members may have different levels of need at or during a meeting and there's a question of our meetings seem to be going so long, could we be able to answer these offline or get it in a Friday memo to really let this be about the deliberation and the work of a board. Um, I, I'm not sure yet if as a board we're saying we need to see the project listing out. Aaron's very clearly said that is something that, that he needs. I would like to know um, as a board, because I'm, I am still trying to balance this on, on the governance and how we're going to to let admin do their job and see if that committee do theirs. And so I want to make sure we're balancing it. And so I want to make sure I understand too as a board what it is we need from, and I, I need to hear multiple voices, what do we need from administration before we are comfortable moving forward with a decision? And there might be one or two of y'all who need something else. I don't think the administration has a problem getting it to you. Um, I think what we need to know this as a board though, what needs to happen during these discussions. Before you answer, I just want to point out one other thing, um, and Erin, this is specifically for you. So just know, please, that we didn't cut anything from the CFAX recommendation. All we did was shift projects out, and I, you'll get to look at this when you get the details, but there's not very many ways to do that. And so the team did a fantastic job of laying that out and letting it make sense. I'm happy for you to pick and choose and make those decisions, but please know that we didn't cut anything from the CFAC recommendation. We just merely shifted 
what made sense to shift, and understand too that that shifting is not just picking and choosing numbers that work on a piece of paper. That is tied deeply into Jimmy's wheelhouse, which is understanding what we can do, when we can do it, and how we can accomplish the end result, which is getting all of this work done inside budget and on time. And so that expertise is not something I have. It's not something that I was going to sit down and say, I, don't, I think this is the three-year cycle. I didn't do that work. Jimmy and his team did that work because that's who needs to do this work. They know and understand how this goes. Jimmy's been in this district for 35 years. He's touched every single facility in this district. And I don't know about you, but when I walk in LISD facilities, I'm just in awe every single time because we don't have a slouch facility anywhere in this district. Out of the 50 facilities we have, there's not one that I walk into and go, well, maybe there's one. Too. I don't know. <laughs> but Jimmy has done an outstanding job of that, and I trust the work that he's done to bring you this recommendation. If we have the materials and we're planning to put them on the website tonight or tomorrow, why can't we present them tonight and review them and discuss them together? I, I just don't understand that. That's the part that baffles me. I, it's, it's stylistic. I came here to have a discussion and I don't have the materials to have the discussion. I, no, you go, sorry. Okay. okay. Um, so, I know I started this, so I'm sorry, <laughs> but I, looking from a three-year to a four-year conversation is kind of the conversation we sort of need to go into Tuesday, Thursday, having some semblance, like, are we, do we have an appetite for that or not? Um, because the ramifications of a 2024 election versus a 2025, um, the appetite of what we think our community will pass, will they pass 933 million versus 813, or the deeper conversation of do we use bond savings and bring that down another $41 million? So to me, that gets it under $700 million, which I think is a stronger um, place to be in bond language for this year, in my opinion. Um, so I, I like the three-year cycle, and I like kind of where we're at. I know um, maybe I had additional questions answered offline, I'm sorry, but I did. But um, I think, you know, that deal with ACC and early college, um, that building, I think that just helps us right now in a time where we're not certain. That campus is not growing as fast as ACC expected, so I think it's a good opportunity to uh, build community partnership, and so I really, like the three-year cycle number and where we're getting to, and I like this um, taking the elementary school and using that $41 million of bond saving and even getting it under $700 million. I think that's a stronger... $800 Yeah, $800 million, sorry. $772. Yeah, $772. $772, I like that. And so, um, to me, I have a stronger appetite for that. I have sat with these numbers, um, and so I feel like that's a good road for me. Thank you, Alexis. I think you verbalized very well what I was thinking. That's what I thought we were, that's what I believed was the intention of tonight, was to, can we do a three year? Can we do a four year? Tell us, you know, how this is exactly what has been done here. I am not, I do not have Jimmy's voting expertise. And so I have, and I don't have Elaine or PFN. I, I, I don't have that expertise. And so what I do need them to tell me is fiscally, how does this work out? Jimmy and his team looking at those projections, what does this look like for a three or four year? So much to what Alexis says, that was the conversation that I thought we were going to have with each other tonight and not Jimmy, let's let's talk, let me tell you how you should be doing your job tonight, Jimmy, because I, I can't do that. Um, so I I agree with Alexis um, that I, I think I think that, that three year with the early college um, 
sounds like a, a really wonderful collaborate, collaboration. I think we're really lucky to be able to have that with ACC. And it's a beautiful campus that, as you mentioned, you know, we would have that room there for a while, and if not, we'd have the potential. I just wanted to chime in. I know last meeting I was pretty passionate. Y'all got to see the passionate side of Anna. I will say though, um, because I was confused, because I kept hearing we're gonna, the three year thing. So she got my head going. And so I appreciate that, Alexis. Um, because I, I honestly thought we were picking and choosing, that's what I thought, and I was kind of concerned about that. And so once I got a better explanation from our amazing admin, I've been bothering them all week, um, it made sense. I thought we were here, because I heard we were discussing the three to four year. I, that's, they're the ones that got my head, because I honestly didn't know we could do that. And so um, I was under the impression when I saw this, I'm like, oh, so this is exactly what they were talking about. We're not actually picking and choosing things. We're just delaying it. And so I was under the impression as well that we were deciding between the four and three year cycle. So I'm just, I, I feel a lot better about the three year cycle, I'll be honest. I know I came out really passionate last Thursday. Um, that's just who I am, y'all know that. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I will say I've gotten great explanations. The bond steering committee met on 729, 728, I think. And Jimmy, y'all did a great, that was some great conversations on the 731. Bond no, bond oversight, yes, I'm sorry guys. I just like to name things, different things. That was a really, honestly, I think that that conversation, the conversation between the bond steering really helped uh, kind of get me an idea of where we're going as far as where we're at, as far as debt and passing future bonds and that. So I appreciate all y'all taking the time to just listen to my thoughts and rambling in regards to this. So Sean and, and Jeremy, I, I was gonna ask you to kind of give our, our, our people who might be listening online on, and kind of catch us back up to speed. When I'm looking at, like I put the, the CFAC information in here and I can pull up all of your meetings and all of the, the slides and so I, quickly looked at the numbers that are on here and I can see where the difference is from a three to a four. It is the administration building in the early college high school. Like those are your, those are your big two heavy hitters. But I'm curious as far as basically on what y'all have seen tonight, do y'all have any additional thoughts you think would be important for the board to know? And then I'll ask you another question after. Uh. Thank you, Madam President, uh, board. My name is Sean Cranston, long time volunteer with the district. I've been living in the district since 2004. Uh, four children have graduated through the district and uh, am current taxpayer for the district. So uh, to answer your question, um, I think what's important that we understand is what we're looking at here, and I apologize, I was not here on the 22nd. My wife was recovering from surgery. So uh, I want to thank Jeremy for carrying the weight for both of us. He did such a great job. You made us both come back. So <laughs> we'll talk after. Uh, but what I can tell you is that, to be clear, um, this is not a reduction in the needs of the district. Uh, the, as, as was alluded to in Dr. Gearing's presentation, there was over $1.5 billion worth of needs identified. I would say as the co-chair of the 2017 bond, which did have fun things in it, there's no fun things in this one. This, this bond uh, that we brought to you, this bond recommendation we brought to you was focused on, on several things. It was focused on uh, first and foremost, student growth in the district. Second thing is uh, how you uh, bring teaching and education into a post-COVID environment. The, the application of education and, and the delivery of education is fundamentally changed in our world from 2017 to today. And then the third thing was how do we impact every student, every campus? My four children, two are special needs. I understand better than most what it takes to bring a child like that through the system because my wife and I have done it, mostly my wife, and it's very difficult. And so we wanted to make sure that we were representing the whole child and when we brought these recommendations to you. We came up with a list of totaling 933 million, which we believe represents the things that are required and my understanding watching tonight is a conversation around not cutting, but rather compressing. So to put it in kind of layman terms, I have four children, lots of drivers. My wife and I decide we need two cars. We can buy two cars now, or we can buy a car now, we can buy a car next year. That just made the car purchasing decision less over shorter time. 
This is a very gross simplification of what I think we're talking about today. Recommending uh, the 933 moving to an 813, all that's doing is lobbing off that final year. And while um, I'm not uh, able to converse uh, in intelligent terms what happened, what I can tell you, if you look at the presentation that Jeremy and I provided you back at the end of June, a lot of the four-year items are now in the next bond, hypothetically, right? And so the big ticket items, to your, to your point, the, the early college high school, some of the, the, the uh, decisions around the school of choice, how we defer. I know that the, the district has looked at a couple major maintenance items that they think we can maybe squeeze a roof or two one more year. And so, ta-da. Guess what, honey? We don't need two cars this year. We'll get, we still need the car. So, so it becomes what's palatable. And, I, and I, what we wanted to give you as a committee was uh, it's a really scary number. It's a big number. And what we wanted to provide you was a number that you could accommodate given your existing financial economic conditions in a way that you wouldn't have to go for a tax rate increase. I also will bring your attention to my opening comments that day was that you can choose to accept, modify, or reject everything that we've made. What I can tell you is that the administration gave us great freedom in listening to the needs of the community. 150 people working over several months totals thousands of man hours, thousands of people hours working on this. And this is what we were told. We weren't told to keep it under a certain number. We weren't told to make sure that these things got in. Aside from the items that we had to defer in 2017 because we didn't have the funds back then. This list of projects are things that we need to provide education for our students and our community. And if you want to make it smaller, then you have to do it faster. So Sean just summed it all up. Uh, he did. He did a great job, always, and he has the great voice. So sorry, just it's just, I know it's just plain plain old Jeremy. But we brought him back for tonight. Uh, but what what I can also uh, add on to that is Sean kind of got to there, but our job was to bring you a com comprehensive list of project needs in this district, where it's three years, four years, five years. We, we had that list. We have that list. We gave you that list. There was a price tag attached to that, but you still have the list of projects that need to happen, whether it's three years or four years. We did not, as a committee, decide when things are going to get done. Uh, we, do, we do rely on administration, Jimmy and his team, to say, well, we need that in three years or that in four years. We, Jimmy actually brought back to us that last meeting that we had saying that these two elementary HVAC comprehensive renovations, we may be able to defer those. We believe that we may be able to. So we just landed those in the parking lot. And then during discussions in the parking lot, we actually elected to have that, brought, bring that back in with the parking lot into the, the comprehensive um, proposal. And so that's what we did. Um, and it's not the price tag that we brought you, it's the comprehensive list of projects. Um, whether you do those in three years, two years, four years, uh, I think we, we kind of leave that into administration's hands to develop what that, that plan looks like. But back to a point that I was sitting in that chair over there last time, and, and I know, Aaron, you did bring up, okay, what does this look like if we compress it down to, to three years? And in, in my head, I didn't have my details with me, but in my head, I'm like, I actually don't think that's a big step to go from four to three. Um, and if you look at how we laid out those tiers in those years, it really wasn't a big chunk that we could just carve off if we went to year three. So technically, that doesn't give you a lot of opportunity. If we would just said, just lop off to year four, well, it, that's not really probably enough to get you where you need to. And I, and I believe that that's where administration kind of took it to another level, right? That we gave them the trust to generate when would you do those if you can push the administration building i'm going to trust that we can do that i do know it's a need so don't take it off there please we, we identified that so i think as a committee um even if we we sit down with them i don't want to speak for them but i think we could still say that we brought you the list of of, of project needs that you need to do so just wanted to add that piece and from administration and and sean and jeremy based on what's going forward well if we elect and make a motion for the three-year um, do you feel 
and I want to know from both of y'all's point of view, that we are still honoring the work that our committee did, our CFAT. I think you doing any bond uh, vote to bring to the electorate is doing good work and honoring the work of the committee. What we're showing you is a very nonpartisan, uh, non-political list of needs that our students need and that our teachers need to provide for our students. It's real simple. How you want to handle that is really up to you under handling that. And if you were to come to Jeremy and I and say, we think it should be smaller, what we're saying is the only way we can get it smaller is for you to do faster. And so all I'm cautioning you is that you are going to have to do another bond sooner. And that's a decision that may or may not be made by another board. Or, uh, but I will tell you this, is we don't know the future. And what we do know, and we heard Dr. Gearing's presentation, 2007's bond was meant to be a holdover. <laughs> and then we had a black swan event, right? We had something that no one predicted, and we had to make do for the next 10 years. And because of that, we had to spend a whole bunch of money in 2017 on a bunch of things that should have been fixed in 2012 and 2015. So as much as you would never want to make a predetermination or force a future political body to make a decision, what you're doing is you're creating an urgency by doing less over a shorter time period today than if you were to do all of it. And I also think there's two stories that we have to tell and two stories that you, you have to tell. One of those stories is how did, if, if there are adjustments, how did we get there? Because we have to let our community know, but they may not know the whole entire story. They may, it depends on when they tune into the conversation, but our CFAC, any committee that you put together and you modify their recommendation, you just want to tell them the story. How did we get here? And I think that that's what me and Sean would want to do with that committee so, so they understand how did we get here? We did a great job, but we made some adjustments along the way. We knew that could happen, but we want to tell that story on, on how we got there. And then the other story is going out to the community. When you f have that number, if you develop one, how did you get to that as well? And some of these conversations that you're having tonight are, par are part of that story. And I'm, gl I'm glad as a, as a community member, as, uh, taxpayer that you're having these conversations whether they be easy or difficult it doesn't matter they're good conversations um, and and I'm glad that we could be a resource that the committee could be a resource uh, from a community's uh, perspective but I think the story is the most important piece uh, of all this um, in the end yeah one thing to add to that Jeremy I would suggest when you had the Basilis Associates uh, survey up you could see that when people were informed their their philosophy may have changed. And I think you've maybe picked up close to 10 percentage points by just telling the story, communicating. So, so uh, as we all move into the community to tell the story, to inform, I think communication is, is key. I'll give you a, a quick example of that. The first meeting that Jeremy and I, Jeremy and I ran for the steering committee was, okay, you know nothing about what we're gonna see. What are you comfortable for a bond? And you know what they were comfortable with? Something looked really close to the last one. It was about $500 million. And then we started presenting. We didn't know where this was gonna go. We did not have influence or even insight into what the five subcommittees were gonna recommend. But then we saw a billion and a half dollars. It's like, okay, how do you get a billion and a half dollars to fit in a half a billion dollar basket? So we had some hard conversations. And from that, that education, that communication process realized that we need to do the hard decisions to benefit our community. And what's clear in that, and one of the things we talked about was this wasn't about my kid, and it wasn't about his kid, and it wasn't about your kid. It's about the kids, because you could approve a bazillion dollars, and you can go send a lane to go get it all tomorrow. 
and whatever dream project that you want to have at your school for your kid won't be built before your kid moves on to the next campus. So this is about how do we benchmark our community. And when we started to talk about the community and benefiting all of the children, not just my area or not just my group, but everybody, guards came down, people started to listen, and the story, as Jeremy said it, the story was told that knowing why we need these things made people a lot more comfortable in voting. And I'm gonna go on a limb here, Jeremy, I have a great memory, it's super short, but I'm pretty sure that we had unanimous consent at the last meeting on the recommendation, yes? So the people that you put on the steering committee, some came, I'm gonna tell you, some came with some personal vested agendas. Every single man and woman in that room voted that we need to recommend to you a $933 million list of projects. The hard job is what are you gonna do with it now? Board members, any questions? Thank you all for coming out again tonight. Um, really appreciate um, the hours, the days, the months, um, and for y'all coming out again this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, thank um, you for the opportunity. It's yeah. an honor, honor to serve. Thank y'all. Board members, um, <clears throat> so we have several questions, I think, on the table before we wrap up this evening, and we'll let uh, Dr. Gehring close out, too, um, and ask any administration if y'all have further questions. But let me kind of start to untangle some of what I think is, is kind of weaving in and out in conversation. Um, I think we had a conversation about whether we do the 900 and, oh, I'm gonna forget the numbers. 33. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we do the four year or can we uh, pace, pace this out? I'll use Sean's example, two cars at two different times instead of all at the same time. Or do we do the three years? And so um, I need to know, board members, do you have information on the four years or three years um, that help you understand that? Do you have any more questions about, do you wanna, I mean, did you wanna do a five year or a two year? Are we okay with keeping four years, three years? Are we good with that information? Okay, um, and then I believe, and, and Aaron, if, if I'm wrong, I believe the question is, in what order will the projects be done in the three years? Is that the next level of information that you're requesting? My expectation was that administration would develop um, a layout of how all of the projects in the CFAC proposed and steering committee approved bond um, roll out over four years because we have to have some sort of bonding schedule, right? And that follows kind of a, a administrative work schedule as well. And so my goal was to try and understand what the administration anticipated that schedule would look like, which would give us an opportunity to pretty easily look at uh, the marker between year three and year four and look at those projects that are kind of on either side of that line and figure out together um, where we thought they should fall in terms of a three-year option. Um, again, not trying to remove anything from the package, right? Um, anticipating that if it's in year four, it goes in year one of the next package, right? Um, also not trying to delay anything, just understanding the natural layout and trying to put our arms around a three-year bite instead of a four-year bite. That was all I wanted to do and have a discussion about what's at the margins. Um, but I don't, I don't have anything to have that discussion with. So um, help me as, as, as we, we move forward. This information, uh, I'm still trying to figure out where, where we're missing each other. I feel like it's sh ships passing in the night. Let's uh, assume to some extent administration has done some of this. Um, how does this help you then? What, what are you looking for? Or, or what, what is it you want to further explore then? The key question is what would fall in the three-year package and what would be in year one of the next package? 
and just trying to have a, an eyes wide open conversation with one another about, is that okay with us, right? Do we, do we see anything that we need to make sure comes into the three-year package? Or are we comfortable with those things that are outside of that three-year package? Um, it's just a, a conversation with us and with our community to make sure we understand how these things lay out and what would land in that three years. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. And, and honestly, that's exactly what we did. So we have the spreadsheet. So it's like when you produce a, a spreadsheet with all these line items and all these numbers, and then you sum the total at the bottom, and we just took that sum total at the bottom and put it in a presentation mode for you to understand the big picture um, of what that is. But we will produce for you the detail that underlies all of this um, immediately after this meeting, and then you'll be able to ask those questions. Can Jimmy tell us, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the big two was the administration and early college high school. How much does that leave off the table then? When there is an elementary school on that list as well that fell naturally in year four. Four, right. You told us about that one. That's come off. Right. These two projects we highlighted because we added them additionally. So if we just chopped off year four, you don't get down to 813 million. You get somewhere just south of 900 million. And we didn't feel like that was adequate to bring back to the board. It didn't make a big enough difference. And so we went through that list again and said, what else that has a significant dollar amount attached to it can we potentially push off knowing that we still got to serve those kids and, serve and manage the growth? And, and so we've tried to paint the reason that we think that these two projects, which are 29 million and 19 million, can be pushed off into that second bond um, that adds up to give us enough money to get down to 813 million. And then we still have that 41 million that we talked about getting us down to 772. So we, we really thought we were bringing you the high level that you needed to make this decision, knowing that the administration has done all the work that underlies this, but of course we're happy to share all of that detail with you um, as soon as we can. Board members, what other information do you need and are you feeling comfortable or ready to have this on our agenda for our next meeting on Thursday? And if you're not ready for that discussion, what else do you need to see from administration? Okay. And we've talked a little bit about seeing what other deliberation do you want to have as a board? What, what other discussion do you want? No, I really like... Um, just the visual and seeing, okay, this is where we can get to and this is reasonable. And then with the $41 million in bond savings, using that for an elementary, I think I am way more comfortable with that $772 million uh, going to bond in a three-year cycle. So I really like that trend. I think that will set us up for success. All right, are there any other questions? All right, board members. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry, one other quick one. Dr. Gearing and I talked previously about our schools of choice versus uh, comprehensive high school seven. Um, none of these materials addresses that question. Um, are there materials I can obtain that will tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, sir. I have a one page on schools of choice that have links to lots of data and everything that we've covered already ready and some additional data and we'd be happy to share that with you tonight. I'll share that with the entire board and the community. Related to the early college high school initiative in particular, um, I don't believe the board has received a presentation about um, how that program would operate, what the benefit to our students would be, and we certainly, as far as I know, haven't um, approved such an initiative. It, it sort of got wrapped into uh, the CFAC and the, and the bond proposal. Um, is there an expectation that the board will receive and approve or authorize that program more formally? Um, and, and what would that timeline? Yeah, my expectation is that you would not do that separately. You would do that as part of this initiative. Um, we have been in a planning year for early college high school for the whole of this last year. We have extended that to a second planning year in order to facilitate the timeline with the CFAC and this bond presentation. Um, I am 100% confident that we have 
the need and the ability to produce an early college high school that give our students the opportunity to graduate with not only a high school diploma, but an associate's degree um, that will serve somewhere between three and 400 students, which if you think about the math out of 42,000 students, um, I feel really confident that I can recommend to you that early college high school is something that this district needs soon. Just giving them time to process, Dr. Gary. I believe you counted to nine. Minutes, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dr. Gehring, I know we've talked uh, before, and I have to tell you still, um, sometimes your presentation style catches me off a bit, but I know I've told you, tell us what your vision is. We need to hear it often. We need to hear it frequent, because it ties in to so many of the things that we're doing. Um, so I didn't realize you were going to tie it in that well with all of the information tonight, but I do see how all the work that we've done as far as core beliefs, vision, mission, and as you heard CFAC, they, you know, talked about not having a story for their kid, but for every kid, and I think that's what I'm kind of seeing the thread coming through. Um, so there's consistency there. So thank you for that. Thank you, Madam President. And it was also nice to take a deep breath because there's a lot of emails we have hitting us. We open up our laptop every time. Any other questions, board members, on this issue or this agenda item? Okay, this is scheduled then for uh, uh, cons consideration at our Thursday meeting. Um, if you think that you want to have more discussion or deliberation with board members, please let administration know so that Dr. Gehring can schedule us enough time. We have very, as y'all know, very hefty agendas. And so we would be wanting to schedule another meeting for August 12th, if that's what we need. So please let Dr. Gehring know um, and the administration. Okay. Just in terms of posting requirements, we will need to make that decision on Thursday night in order to post effectively for the 12th. Board members, there's no other discussion, questions? I waited my nine seconds, so I just went for a second ask. All right, Dr. Gary, do you have anything else to conclude for us this evening? No, thank you. All right. All right, board members, if there are no objections, it is 8.15 p.m., and we will now adjourn. We'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>